Morning, church. Indeed, not only in God do we trust, but the prophet Isaiah also tells us, the Lord waits to be gracious to, to us, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to us. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So together, we have come together as a family of God in our Father's presence to offer him praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive his holy word, to bring before him the needs of the world, to ask his forgiveness of our sins, and to seek his grace that through his Son, Jesus Christ, we may give ourselves to his service. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us of our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May I invite you to sit on you as we confess our sins to Almighty God and allow the Holy Spirit to search for anything in our hearts and our spirits that need to be brought for repentance and forgiveness. Together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Receive God's forgiveness. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. As a forgiven people, let us stand to praise God. worship you. Oh, we worship you. We sing, I have decided. And I have decided and I have resolved to wait upon you, Lord. My rock and redeemer, shield and reward, and I Surely as the sun will rise, you come to us, certain as the dawn appears, you come, let your glory fall as you respond. i 
It is paid in 
the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, who is free indeed. Now my death is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of no hold on me whom the sun sets free who is free indeed oh the rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul creation worship you. Resurrection means sunrise. There is 
Oh, you will come again, Father. You will come and make all things new. And when we meet you, Father, may the only response we have is to fall on our knees in awe of you, God. Praise that one name is the name above every name. To the ends of the earth, may your name be great and praise God. We thank you, God. We wait on you, God. Reveal your us, God. Reveal yourself to us again, God. Continue in our worship as we pray to collect together. Together. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Teach us to offer ourselves to your service that here we may have your peace and in the world to come may see you face to face through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Church, let us continue in this posture of worship as we enter a time of intercession. For the Diocese of Singapore, Heavenly Father, today we pray for St. Andrew's Community Chapel and St. Andrew's City Church. We pray for the respective vicars, Reverend Daniel Tong and Reverend Edwin Tan. Father, we ask that you fill them with godly wisdom, discernment and courage as they lead your people with the aim of building lives, winning souls and learning to rest and rely on your spirit. For our very own parishes in James Church, Father, we pray today for the children in SGC as we just celebrated Children's Day. May each child grow in their love and knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. And may they stand firm in their faith all the days of their life. Help them see and know in their hearts that you are their Heavenly Father and that you have good plans for them, plans to give them a hope and a future. Indeed, we also praise your name and thank you, Lord, for chains that have been broken, for eyes that have been opened, for lives that have been saved. Last night, the Alpha Weekend away for those people who gave their lives to you. Father, we ask that you continue to minister to them today as enter the last day of the Alpha Weekend Away. And we pray that more guests today will be touched by ways that only they will know that you are their Heavenly Father and that they will feel your redeeming love and they'll give their lives to you this morning at the second calling. For the world, Lord, we pray for your peace and comfort for the families of the football stadium stampede in Indonesia and those affected by the childcare shooting in North Thailand. Father, we do not, we do not know why these things happen, but we take comfort that you bring us through the suffering. Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you bring comfort to each of the families involved especially those who are mourning the unexpected loss of a loved one. And may your healing be upon those who are injured and hospitalised. Here in our own nation of Singapore, Father, we pray that as the core inflation rate rises, our government will find ways to mitigate the higher cost of living and those struggling financially will be provided for. We also pray for the protection of the physically vulnerable amongst us 
as COVID-19 cases are again on the rise. May you continue to watch over and protect us and our frontline medical personnel who are dealing with this. Finally, church, let us all take a moment to remember those we know who are suffering in body, mind and spirit. Let us lift each of them to the Lord by name. Father, we ask that these brothers and sisters that we've lifted up to you by name, that they experience the love, peace and comfort that only you can give, and that you strengthen them in their body and mind and spirit. And by your grace and mercy, bring upon healing in your perfect timing and will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Indeed, what a joy we can sing a thousand hallelujahs to praise the name of Jesus. My apologies for the slight technical issue at the beginning of the service. I had read from Psalm 91 to encourage all of us, especially for those who are anxious or struggling, to look to the Lord. Please allow me to read again. Psalm 91 verses 1 and 2, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Thanks be to God. A warm welcome, dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, to the house of the Lord, both on-site and online. Especially if you are here for the first or even the second time, we welcome you in the name of the Lord. Anyone here? First or second time, would you just raise your hand? We'd like to acknowledge your presence with us. Yes, I have some friends on my left here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks be to God over here. Host, praise be to God. Welcome you. Why don't we just stand and just take a few moments to say hi to someone around you. Say, good to see you today. <laughs> praise God. Those online, you can see us, but we can't see you, but good to see you too, in any case. <laughs> Wonderful. Do stay back after the service for a time of breakfast, if your schedule allows. I have three announcements for us. The first, we rejoice that Enable Ministry celebrates its first anniversary next weekend. Enable is a special ministry to special uh, needs, uh, brothers and sisters in our midst, and we are uh, so glad that next weekend we have invited uh, Brother Liao Wenping from Koinonia Inclusion Network, and together with another brother in Christ, uh, Alistair, to be sharing with us at all three services. And in view of this celebration of the Enable's first anniversary, uh, they have uh, worked very hard together with the staff and the volunteers to be doing uh, pouches, drawstring pouches, as well as uh, hand stamp notebooks for sale next weekend. And all proceeds will go towards our church uh, missions uh, fund. So church, do look out. Uh, you're able to next week stay back and interact and uh, be, uh, be encouraged by what God is doing in and through this uh, ministry. Second, in view of Enable's uh, celebration next weekend, uh, although it's a third weekend, uh, we will not have Holy Communion next week, but instead Holy Communion will be celebrated on the fourth weekend on the 22nd and 23rd of October. So just a note for us to remember. The last announcement is about Children's Day special at Super Power Kids on the 16th of October. Next Sunday, a special a celebration for all the dear children in our midst. So for all the children in our midst, you are most welcome. And also, if you have fam uh, friends and families with children aged 4 to 11, we want to welcome them to come together on next Sunday to celebrate the great joy. So registration link is available. Do register so that the organizers can plan uh, accordingly. So let's encourage the children to come together that they will know Jesus and they have the wonderful joy of being children. Let us now prepare to return God his tithe 
and give our free will offering. Let me pray. Father, we give you thanks for every provision and blessing. Lord, for this tithe, we return to you. And for the joy of giving, thank you, Father. And we pray you grant us every wisdom to steward it well for the growth and advancement of your eternal kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today's scripture reading is taken from Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21, and Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 to 15. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 21. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it, the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh." Chapter 20, verses 7 to 15. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, 
Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were with, who were in them. And they were judged, each of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning, church. Testing, morning. Oh, sorry, it's not uh, working. Sorry, a lot of technical issues. Oh, okay. In the Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Sam and Frodo, the main characters of the story, are on a mission to destroy this one powerful ring, which, once destroyed, would lead to the destruction of the Dark Lord Sauron and, and his vast armies who were ravaging the world and would thereby usher in a new world order of complete peace. After Sam and Frodo finally managed to complete their mission to destroy this ring by throwing it into a lake of fire, they were recovering in a friend's home when, <laughs> sorry, when Sam woke up, surprised that he was still alive, that he had survived the mission, and he asked this question, is everything sad now going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? That's quite a profound statement. Is everything sad going to come untrue? It's different from asking, is everything good and happy going to come true? Rather, he asks, is everything sad to come untrue? When the Bible speaks of the new world to come, the new heavens and the new earth, it often speaks of it in terms of the absence of sad things. A famous example is the phrase, there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, for former things have passed away. And we find this description in both Old and New Testaments. You see, because there's so much that is sorrowful and agonizing, and distressing in our present world, in order for us to properly appreciate all that the new world is, all that the new heavens and the new earth is, we must first be told all that it is not. Everything sad will come untrue when Jesus comes again. Everything sad will come untrue at the return of the King. And that's the sermon title for today. Uh, I took this image from the Lord of the Rings. Um, but it's an appropriate title for our message. Uh, today's passage from Revelation is all about the event of the king's return. Our passage today begins in chapter 19, verse 11, and it opens with these words, Then I saw heaven open. This short phrase is significant, for previously in the book of Revelation, the author John had said, I saw a door in heaven open, or I saw the temple in heaven open. He had glimpses and sneak peeks of what goes on in heaven but now heaven itself splits open. This is the day when heaven is to come down to earth. This is the day when heaven and earth are to become one. And I saw heaven open and behold, a white horse. From the verses that follow, we quickly learn that it is Jesus himself who rides on this white horse as a divine warrior coming down to the earth 
white, a symbol for purity. He has come to war against evil and establish purity, righteousness on the earth. So the whole story of the book of Revelation has reached its climax here. This is the long-awaited day for the people of God. This is the day of our final salvation. And many readers of the story, I imagine, will be eagerly anticipating at this point to be told all that the divine warrior, Jesus, goes on to do. Tell me about this war that he wages against evil. Tell me about the new world order of peace that he sets up. Tell me all that he does for us. But before the storyline proceeds to describe all that he does, we are first given a portrait of all that he is. Before a description of his actions, first a description of his attributes. Verses 11 to 13, the one sitting on a horse is called faithful and true. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the descriptions of Jesus actually go on for another three verses. I uh, don't have the time to highlight the rest of them. But I think the Bible intentionally pulls the brakes in the unfolding of the narrative to paint this comprehensive portrait of Jesus in order to remind us of this important fact, that the ultimate reason why Jesus comes again is not merely for our salvation, but for His glory to reveal the glory of who he is. He is coming again to be glorified as one who is faithful and true. He is faithful and true to his word to bring us salvation on the last day. He is coming again to be glorified for his righteousness in the way he judges and wars against all evil. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He is coming again to be glorified for his burning holy zeal in the way he sees and notices every evil deed and acts against it. On his head are many diadems or crowns. He's coming again to be glorified for his unassailable sovereignty and power over the whole world. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. In biblical times, names convey the nature and character of a person. So a name no one knows but himself speaks of his ultimately mysterious nature. Our finite minds cannot fully comprehend all that he is. He's coming again to fully reveal himself yet we will spend an eternity plumbing the depths of all that he is. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. He's coming again to personally reveal his scars from the cross and, ex and to express to us the extent of his love. And the name by which he's called is the Word of God. He's coming again to bring revelation of who God is, the, the Word of God. In other words, he's coming again to glorify God the Father. So the King comes for his glory and for the glory of God. Now, after the portrait of the king, then the performance of the king is narrated down in verse 17. But let me pick up the storyline first in verses 19 and 20. It says this, And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered for the war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet. And so we are told of a final war, a final rebellion involving the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies. It's a rebellion on a global scale. Now, this event is the same battle of Armageddon that was talked about two weeks ago um, in the sermon on chapter 16 by Pastor Glenn. So let me quickly go back to chapter 16 to, to paint the scenario again from verses 13 to, 7, uh, 13 to 15. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to gather them for war on the great day of God the Almighty. And so this climactic war is instigated by the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, or the unholy trinity. The unholy trinity, as we've been calling them in our sermon series. The dragon represents Satan. The beast, well, was first introduced in the story of Revelation back in chapter 13 which was a number of weeks ago now, and there it stood for the evil Roman Empire, which was oppressing the first century readers of Revelation, the, the original readers of Revelation. And so it continues in our world to represent ungodly and unjust political powers. The false prophet was also first introduced back in chapter 13, where it represented the Roman imperial cult, the practice of emperor worship. And so the false prophet in our world continues to represent religious powers that propagate deceptive worldviews and false religion. And in the last days, the unholy trinity, the dragon, beast, the false prophet, Satan, 
Satan manipulated political powers, Satan manip manip manipulated religious powers, worked to stir up a vast and widespread deception across the earth. Out of their mouths, three unclean spirits. Mouths a reference to speech, so deception that goes abroad to the kings of the whole world to gather them for war. And this, in my opinion, really need not be understood as a literal war, um, given the symbolic nature of the book of Revelation and how war is used elsewhere in the book to refer to strong opposition to the ways of God, right? strong rebellion against God. This reminds us of what the Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the day of Christ's return does not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, which is by the activity of Satan with all wicked deception and strong delusion when the one who restrains moves out of the way. And I don't have the time to um, go into the details of this passage in 2 Thessalonians, but we're told that the restraints on evil will come off and rebellion, lawlessness, deception, delusion ensues. The truths of God will be obscured, the ways of God will be ignored and thrown out and trampled upon. There will be a climactic intensification of evil in the last days. It gets exceedingly dark just before the dawn. And then suddenly, as we just sung in worship earlier, he shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night. The blazing sun that is Christ shall pierce the dark night of those evil last days and of this dark and evil age that we live in. And the rebellion will be put down in an instant. Coming back to our passage, Revelation 19, 20 to 21. And the beast was captured with it, the false prophet. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. Those who participated in the rebellion of Armageddon will receive their due judgment. Now this passage here mentions the beast and the false prophet being captured. But what about the dragon? The first member of the unholy trinity, right? Satan himself. Satan's fate is told to us in the next chapter, jumping ahead to chapter 20 from verses 7 to 10. It says, When a thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth to gather them for the war. Their numbers like the sand of the sea. And the devil who, who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, to say scholars are very much divided about whether to understand this passage here as a description of Armageddon, so yet another description of Armageddon, or whether it's telling us that there will be another rebellion that takes place a thousand years later, a thousand years after Christ comes again. It's a debate about the millennium, uh, which some of you may have heard about before, and it's a very extensive debate, so I don't have the time to go into it. But whatever your view, whether you believe this passage is talking about Armageddon or whether you believe it's telling us that there's another great rebellion a thousand years after Christ comes again, whatever your position, we all agree that Satan is roundly defeated at the end. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's the eternal destruction of the unholy trinity. And in a very elegant and thoughtful way that the Apostle John has composed the book of Revelation, the enemies of God are described to be destroyed one by one in the reverse sequence that they were introduced in the story. In chapter 12, the dragon was introduced, Satan. Chapter 13, the beast and the false prophet were introduced, the beast representing ungodly, unjust political powers, the false prophet, false religion, deceptive worldviews. In chapter 17, Babylon was introduced, which was Pastor John's sermon last week, representing the ungodliness of society and culture that we all presently live in. And in reverse sequence, one by one, they fall. Chapter 18, Babylon falls, ungodly society and culture that oppresses us with all of its immorality and idolatry and injustices will be brought to an end. Chapter 19, the beast falls, all godless and unjust political powers, all corrupt and oppressive governments that afflict us will be brought to an end. The false prophet falls. All deceptive worldviews and false religion that stumble us will be brought to an end. In chapter 20, the ultimate cause of all evil, the dragon himself, Satan, is brought to an end. And they are said to be all thrown into the lake of fire 
forever and ever. Note the finality and the totality of the destruction of the forces of evil. Finally, death itself is said to be destroyed. Revelation 20, 14. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Everything said will come untrue. History will end in a most glorious way and we are unalterably headed towards a grand conclusion, a grand climax, a grand crescendo. The world is not going to remain as it is now forever. And so the title of my first main point is A Final Battle That Christ Wages When He Comes Again, Evil Will Be, will be Abolished. A Final Battle, Evil Will Be Abolished. Now in the meantime, however, life is difficult in this fallen world, and it can be very difficult. And for each of the main points of my message today, I thought to connect them to a famous line in the book of Psalms that articulates a common concern or question that arises as we journey through a fallen world, a fallen and broken world. And the line in the Psalms that I thought to connect this first main point to is the cry, How long, O Lord, in Psalm 13? The psalmist said in Psalm 13, How long, O Lord, must I wrestle in my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? Maybe the difficulties of this life have caused you to say the same. How long must I continue to suffer these injustices that I face? How long must they continue to endure under this oppressive political regime? How long must I carry this overwhelming grief of bereavement? How long must I keep on every day battling with sin and deceptive worldviews that so easily entangle me? How long must I endure the pains of my illness or the effects of my mental health condition? Oh, it's hard to imagine living on like this for even another day. How long, O oh Lord? Knowing and remembering that one day all sad things will come untrue can help to lighten our steps in this fallen world. As the Apostle Paul told us in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. This life is temporal. All sad things will come untrue one day soon. Paradise shall be restored in the end. And this is a balm that we can apply to the agonies of life that cause us to cry out, How long, O Lord? And so the first main point is a final battle, evil is abolished. The second main point is a final banquet, justice will be served. Final banquet, justice will be served. This is based on chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. Let me read it again. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. It's a gory and gruesome supper prepared by God. It's a banquet for the birds to feast on the flesh of the whole army that warred against God in the war of Armageddon. Come eat the flesh of kings, of captains, of mighty men, of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. In other words, every single participant in the rebellion, leader or follower, small or great, is said to be slain and is said to have their body gorged on by scavenging birds. It's a graphic and gruesome image that symbolizes a terrifying fate. And it's a very stark counter-image to another supper that was described just earlier in the chapter, verse 9. Blessed are those invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, it's a tale of two suppers, a glorious supper and a gory supper. A supper in which one feasts and another supper in which one is feasted upon. Two very contrasting destinies. God is a God of grace, but He's also a God of justice. He will dispense judgment on the last day according to the evil that is done in this life. There will be a reckoning and an accounting of every evil deed. His holiness demands it. Now perhaps in this life, however, you may have at times wondered, doubted, questioned whether God is a God who is truly concerned about justice. Maybe it has seemed to you at times that he's rather indifferent to evil and wickedness in the world. And perhaps you have been vexed by this question that the psalmist asked in Psalm 73, why do the wicked prosper? Why do people seem to get away with heinous acts of evil, with complete impunity? Why do people who are bent on wickedness flourish and thrive in life and have so much going for them, living without troubles and cares in the world, 
living in fact in luxury? Is God actually concerned about justice? Is God actually concerned about evil? This is what the author of Psalm 73, who's called Asaph, wrote. As for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped. In other words, he had a crisis of faith. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pangs until death, their bodies are fat and sleek, they're not in trouble as others are, they're not stricken like the rest of mankind, therefore pride is their necklace, violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness, their hearts overflow with, with follies. They scoff and speak with malice, loftily they threaten oppression, they set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongues struts through the earth. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease, they increase in riches. How did Asaph resolve his tension? Moving down to verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. God will settle all accounts in the end. He's a God who is just, and justice delayed is not justice denied. And in this vein, God forbids us also to take vengeance and retribution into our own hands. Only He is righteous enough to settle accounts. As Romans 12, 17 to 20 instruct, Repay no one evil for evil. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. And knowing that God is just, that He's a just God, frees us and releases us to obey the command of Jesus to love our enemies instead. As this passage goes on to tell us, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. God is just and we can leave justice to him and focus on loving our enemies. So the first main point, a final battle, evil will be abolished, responding to the cry, how long, O Lord? The second point is a final banquet, justice will be served, responding to the cry, why do the wicked prosper? And the third point is a final book, grace will be magnified. A final book, grace is magnified. We come to the last scene of our passage today, chapter 20, 11 to 15. And let me read it again. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the day of final judgment. God is said to take his seat on a great white throne. White, a symbol again for purity, for holiness. God has come down as holy judge. And from his presence, earth and sky flee, and no place was found for them. This is probably symbolic language to express the sheer holiness of God who has descended to the earth. Before him, earth and sky, the created order in which man dwells, which has been polluted and defiled by our sin, as the book of Genesis tells us. Before him, they flee and they have no place to hide. God blazes in his holiness. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And verse 13, The sea gave out the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave out the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, these verses express the universal scope of the judgment day. All humanity who has ever lived will rise again and will stand before him on that day. And we are told that books were open. Verse 12, And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Again, verse 13, Each one was judged according to what they had done. And so books that are the records of our deeds will be open on that day. And it doesn't say that, th that these books are open only for the non-Christians. Uh, it seems that these books are open for all, Christians and non-Christians alike. What's the purpose of reviewing the deeds of Christians on that day, since we'll be saved by grace? I think one purpose is the effect it will have on us as the books of our deeds are open before the God who blazes in His holiness, before whom earth and sky flee. And it become manifestly clear to us on that day once again how utterly wretched and sinful we are and how utterly dependent we are on the grace of God for our salvation. As Isaiah 64, 6 says, even all our righteous deeds are like filthy rags before the holy God. 
And so thankfully and mercifully, there is a second book that is open that overrides the first first 12, then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And at the opening of this second final book, the grace of God will be magnified. I'd like to make a comment about this phrase in verse 12. Great and small stood before the throne. You may be someone considered some as great by society or by the people around you. You may be a man of many accomplishments, accolades, and man's applause. And that may have caused you to feel like you can speak of a certain level of worthiness and righteousness before God, and that you have in part, at least, merited your salvation, earned your salvation based on your own goodness. Remember that you're entirely dependent on the second final book and not the first. Your salvation is entirely by grace. On the other hand, you may consider yourself to be someone small. You may despair about your worthiness to be saved. You fear that you are too, you are, you are too wretched a sinner. They have gone too far and too long in persistent sin. You have fallen from grace. You have lost it all. Remember that you are are entirely dependent on the second final book and not the first. Your salvation is entirely by grace. The knowledge that salvation is by grace alone, therefore, tears down arrogance on the one hand and despair on the other. It deals with arrogance and anxiety. It humbles the confident. It gives confidence to the humble. Now, this third point of a final book, Grace Will Be Magnified, responds to the question of the psalmist in Psalm 24. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can make it to heaven? A most fundamental question we've all grappled with at one point or another. How can man be saved? It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it's not grace plus my merit. It's not faith plus my works. It's not Christ's righteousness plus my righteousness. Grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that was the cry of the whole Protestant Reformation 500 years ago. The man who kickstarted the whole Reformation was a man called Martin Luther. And before the clear-headed theologian that he was, he was a confused man. Before the powerful force that he was, he was a tormented failure. Before he knew spiritual peace, he lived in constant spiritual pain. He was a depressed man, and profoundly so, wrought with guilt and living in persistent anxiety. Why? Because he was taught growing up as a Roman Catholic that though salvation is by grace, that grace had to be earned. And he was constantly tormented in his conscience that he was not good enough, that he would not make it to heaven. And so he decided to give himself to every conceivable discipline to make sure he he would earn his way into heaven. He moved into a monastery, became, uh, became a monk, And there he maintained a meager diet of mostly just bread and water. At times he would fast to the point that his friends thought he was going to die. He was taught that if he wore uncomfortable clothing and put some additional things in his shoes and around his waist that inflicted pain on his body, that would make him more worthy before God. And so he did that. He gave himself to begging, which was considered the most humiliating thing a person could do. He confessed his sins to his confessor incessantly, sometimes six hours at a time. He once walked 800 miles from his home in Germany all the way to Rome and 800 miles back in order to visit the Scala Sancta, which are the supposed steps that Jesus walked up to Pilate's judgment hall. He crawled up those steps, kneeled at every step, bowed down, kissed the step, and progressed that way all the way to the top. He basically did everything he could, but he never had peace. He never had rest in his soul. He never had a sense of forgiveness. Until one day, as he was studying the Bible, he came to the book of Romans, and there uncovered the true gospel of grace. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's entirely dependent on one's belief in Jesus Christ and what he has done. Dying on the cross to pay the full penalty of our sins, there's nothing we can do to merit eternal life. And upon learning what the true gospel is, a flood of peace rushed into his heart, and in his words he said, I felt like I had been reborn and gone through the open doors of paradise. How can man be saved? How can man be made right with God? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Simply by putting one's belief and trust in Jesus on what he has done on the cross for our sins. He paid the full penalty for our sins that we may have life. Allow me to summarize as I close. At the return of King Jesus, he will wage a final war, a final battle, and evil will be abolished. Responding to the cry, how long, O Lord? 
He prepares a final banquet and justice will be served, which responds to the cry, How, why, why do the wicked prosper? And he'll open a final book and grace will be magnified, which responds to the cry, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Let us pray. Now, I thought that perhaps there may be some of us here today who have not yet made a decision to put your trust in Jesus and what he has done for you, dying on the cross to pay the penalty of your sins. And you may have been in church for a while, but you may not have made a decisive step to receive Christ. And on hearing the message today, if you like to do so, I'd like to invite you to just repeat in your heart this simple prayer that I'm, that I'm about to pray. May I just give, just give us a few moments to reflect and to ponder if there's any of us who would like to receive Christ and what He has done for you, for us on the cross, for our sins. If you would like to do so, just repeat this prayer in your heart after me. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for the sins I've committed in life. I repent of them. And I renounce them. Thank you for loving me so much. To the extent that you would die an excruciating death on a Roman cross for my sins. I'd like to receive you into my life as my saviour and as my Lord. I would like to give my heart to following you all the days of my life. Help me to live this out. Help me to know that I now belong to you as your child and that you will be with me daily and that you will one day take me to be with you in the glory of heaven forever. Amen. And if you have said this prayer for the first time, I'd like to encourage you to approach one of the pastors or prayer team after the service or um, yeah, when the prayer team approaches, uh, comes up to the front. Just like to encourage you to approach them so that they can give you some support in your journey as a Christian. Let me just close in quickly in prayer for the rest of us. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you are coming again for us one day soon. It will be the end of all things said. We look forward with eager anticipation, Lord, and help us to live with hope in the heart that strengthens us amidst the trials and difficulties of this fallen world. And Lord, for our family and friends who have yet to know you, we ask for grace. Use us as your instruments to bring them to the knowledge of you. Be glorified in all the world. Come, Lord Jesus, and consummate your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand together? Soon and very soon, see the process.
May I invite us just to take a seat for a moment. And in the spirit of reflection, continue to allow God's word to speak to our hearts. Indeed, soon and very soon, Jesus is returning. Is there an urgency of the gospel in our hearts today? I don't know about you, but when I read chapter 20, verse 15, that says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Anyone's name not written in the book of life, thrown into the lake of fire. So church, would you just take a few moments to pray, commit to God, your loved ones and friends, family, parents, spouse, siblings, children, your colleagues, your buddies, who have not yet come to faith in Jesus, that their name will be written in the book of life. Would you weep for them? Pray for them? Will you testify to them the grace of God? As you think about it, nothing else really matters in life more important than the souls of men and women. So would you just take a few moments, name them one by one, before God, would you? Lord, we can only plead for your mercy, Lord, for the names that we have presented to you. Lord, that they may know and experience your grace and your love, Lord, that their names will be written in the book of life. Lord, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And as we await, Lord, for their decision to believe in Christ, Lord, may we know your peace during the period of waiting. Church, I invite you to stand as I pronounce God's blessing. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. So church, during the closing song, the altar is open for prayer. The prayer team, please come. We'll be here. Anyone come forward for salvation? Or oh, pray need, do come, we would be glad to pray with you. Ministry team, please. We declare this.